I'm at the Sackville Community Garden today, and this is a broad fork. We'll talk more about that later. We're gonna plant a row of peas, and we're gonna walk you through the steps that we're taking, including using a broad fork. You're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. I'm Chef Alan Barber. And I'm Master Gardener Sarah Evans. Today we're at the Sackville Community Garden in Sackville, New Brunswick, and it's a gorgeous day. It's midway through May, and it's time to plant. Yeah. The weather forecast for the foreseeable future is close to 20 degrees during the day and around 10 degrees at night. There's no frost warnings for the next two weeks as far as we know, that could change, but now it's time to start planting all of the garden beds. It's true, we might still get a freak frost at the beginning of June, but as long as you're aware of that happening, you can proceed with caution and definitely planting seeds and planting any cold hardy transplants is uh, perfect timing. So today we're going to use a broad fork to split up uh, some soil and add some organic matter. And then we planted some peas in that bed. And so we're gonna explain the steps of planting peas and why we uh, make the beds mound shaped. Looking forward to it. This is a broad fork and it's a really good tool in an area like this where we have multiple beds. This has got six tines and it's about the same width as our garden beds. And what we do with this broad fork is we step on it and push it into the soil and then we pull it up. And you can see how it's brought up a large swath of our dirt and you can see this is the dirt that we are planting into, which has very little organic matter. And this is the organic matter we've added to the top. But by using this broad fork, we're mixing this together. And we'll have to do this year after year until eventually this whole layer is a good mix. But this is very poor soil that we're planting into this year. I'm gonna do this whole row with the broad fork. And we're eventually gonna do all of the rows that we put in. So. We're mixing this up today, and then we're gonna add more compost material on top of it, and we're going to plant peas. The other thing the broad fork does, which is really good, is it looses up the compaction of the soil, and it also allows air into the soil, which is really important, because air is important for the microbe biological activity. And we also want this to allow water so we don't have a hard pan crust on top of our garden beds. This will let water and air and back and different organisms into the deeper layers of the soil, which is great for root health and great growth. What are you doing, Sarah? I'm adding more compost on top uh, just to build up the organic matter in the soil, give the peas something to germinate into and something to grow. So this is a composted uh, manure that uh, we got from a local landscape company. So why do we want to use composted manure specifically? Uh, it has a lot of different uh, nutrients in it. It will be a slow release uh, fertilizer over time. It has really nice, rich uh, organic matter in it already. So there's some like wood material, but there's also uh, a lot of worms, a lot of microbial activity already happening in there. And that's going to transfer into the soil and build up the microbial life. So it's really dark. Is that... Dark is awesome. So organic matter, you can almost just see from the get-go, it's the decomposing material in your soil that's already dead or is still living. So it's gonna be dark colored as opposed to a soil, which uh, is what we are starting with here, which is more of like a minerally light color. Am I holding cow poo in my hand right now? <laughs> You're ho holding once, once cow poo. I would say so, but it's been uh, through a process probably over more than a year where it's been heated up to a point where it's not cow poo anymore. Does it smell like cow poo? No, it doesn't smell like anything. And it has like little bits of wood chip and hay in it. So it's not just, or it wasn't just cow manure. Obviously they added other things. To yeah, it. when they have a commercial composting facility, what they'll be doing is uh, mixing the, the manure that they get with all kinds of different other materials, sort of the carbon nitrogen balance. So yeah, they'll make it into something that uh, composts quickly and composts hot. So that'll kill any uh, nasty microorganisms. So is there anything in this alive now or has it all been killed? Well, there's worms in there. Okay. And I would say there's different kinds of bacteria. There may be some fungi living in there still. 
So oh, yeah. it, after it gets to a heating point, then it rests for a while, and that's when uh, the decomposition now, happens. Now, the material that you're putting this over top of is also compost, but this is much different. Yeah, so the other stuff is a composted uh, seafood product. So that comes from a peat moss farm that's in New Brunswick, and then they mix in uh, basically byproducts from fish plants and shellfish plants. So yeah, you I can, can see mussel shells Exactly, in here. you can see little bits of mussel, mussel shells, little bits of uh, lobster shells sometimes, and that this stuff is pretty common in the Maritimes. You can get it uh, even in bags at the hardware store. And again, you're just taking something that has a lot of nitrogen in it that's like a really good product and then they mix it together with all kinds of different materials to compost it and they compost it to a hot 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 temperature and then cool it down and this has been here for a year so this pile was sitting in the community garden over the winter so it's like really composted a lot and underneath this we have the original dirt which is kind of dead yeah it doesn't have any darkness to it it's just sort of clay and sand and stones. So we're hoping that this creates biological growth by adding organic material. Yeah. But for biological growth, we also need oxygen and water. So this compost is fairly moist that we're putting on top. And it's quite loose as well. So it's not like, it's like easy to put a shovel into and to knock onto the ground. Uh, it's really nice compost. And so you said this has also got peat in it. Is peat good or bad? Peat, uh, it's like many things in the world. It can be good or it can be bad. It can be harvested in a way that's more sustainable or it can be uh, less sustainable because it is really a non-renewable resource in a lot of ways because peat bogs take so long to form, like thousands of years. So I think in moderation, it's an uh, okay thing to use, but the landscape industry has been over-reliant on peat for a very long time. So mixing it up a little bit is a good idea. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get this bed finished. Cool. Our bed is prepped. We're going to plant peas in here. Uh, we've added a lot of organic material. We broad forked. We added organic material, two kinds, sea compost and manure compost. Then we've made a mound. It just seems natural to make a mound, but why do we make a mound? This gives the newly emerging plant a lot of space to grow into, so it's not going to have to break through into the soil down below. Uh, it'll be able to really reach its roots into the soil, get some good nutrients, uh, have a lot of uh, space for air and water to move around. So this gives it a, a growing area. And what about, is there something to do with like warmth of the soil? Yeah, the soil is a pretty good temperature right now for peas, which we're planting today. Uh, they need the soil to be probably like five to seven degrees Celsius. Uh, I'd say we're above that, but this is going to warm the soil up more if you're early in the season and you want to plant something that needs that germination temperature. So do you want to show us and as you do it, explain to us how to plant pea? For sure. So peas are just uh, beautiful little round seeds. Uh, you can soak them in water overnight. They're that actually peas. They're right. actually peas. They're yeah. dried out peas. Yep. So you can save pea seeds really easily uh, if you just let some dry on the vine. Um, and these guys don't need to go up or down a certain way. They're just little uh, round wrinkly seeds. And I usually plant peas in a little clump instead of in a line. Oh. I don't know. I've read that they like growing that way. So uh, I could plant in a straight row. And I'm going to just make a straight row across the top of this. But then instead of one at a time, I'm going to just put like four or five in every two inches. That's so how deep? I'm going to plant them. The general rule with uh, seeds is they say plant them twice as deep as they are big. So that's about a centimeter down. You can go a little bit deeper than that. But that's just sort of a rule of thumb. Bigger seeds go deeper small tiny seeds they just get like almost sprinkled on the surface they don't even need anything awesome yeah so little clumps here and i usually like to like plant them and then i'll cover them up at the end because if you cover them up as you go sometimes you're like where did i plant them i can't tell and with the pea seed how long should i wait like if i don't see anything should i throw my hands in the air and give up and go buy a bag of frozen uh, peas or like it should these come up in like two days or in weeks? Or? No, I would say like 
a week, probably one to two weeks. So the warmer the soil is, uh, the quicker they're going to germinate. So they, um, two weeks ago, they would have taken more like two weeks. I would say we'll see them emerging in a week or 10 days at this point. Okay. And then, uh, would I, is this enough or would you plant another, like in a week or two, would you plant more or is this should be good? I'd say when you start to see them emerging, you can tell if, uh, how many are coming up and then you could plant another little, uh, row of clumps right next to it because it's kind of nice to do that with peas because you're picking them all the time, but they all get to a point pretty quickly where they've finished flowering and they've put out enough pods. And then if you have another flush of peas coming up, maybe two weeks later, then you'll have a extended pea harvest and peas are easy to do that with and we have to put in a trellis you can't grow peas like on the ground you have to make them go up but yeah. we have a couple of weeks before that trellis exactly has to be in. and you'll see some peas are listed as dwarf peas but even those peas are like two feet high and they get kind of floppy if you don't put them on a trellis other peas are like climbers i actually don't know what kind of peas these are because they're just labeled peas and they're out of the community garden seed library so we're going to find out but I think we'll supplement them with another kind of pea that we do know what it is and a tall climber. And can you plant peas? How long? Okay. How many days does it take for the peas to hit maturity? Like when can I eat a pea? Uh, probably around 60 to 65 days to maturity, I would say. So that's like two months. Two months. That's so, on like the tighter end of the scale for vegetables. So it's halfway through May, so June, July. So sometime in July we'll get peas. Yeah. And we can also eat the flowers? Yeah, you can eat the flowers. You can eat the shoots also. That's why I also like to plant like clumps and have a lot of them coming up because then if you've got a nice big clump of peas coming up, you can be clipping the shoots off and eating those as greens. The tendrils are edible. The whole thing is they're totally delicious. Now, peas don't like it to be too hot, though. Yeah, exactly. So the peas will be germinating now. This is pretty much perfect soil temperature. I'd say it's around 10 to 12 degrees. But when it gets too warm and the soil is like as hot as the outside when it's more in the 20 degree range, the peas will stop germinating. Uh, and they also don't like flowering. So they may grow greens, but they're going to hesitate to flower when the temperatures are in those like high 20 Celsius. So plant your peas early and plant them often. Yeah. And, eat and the then shoots, take a break. The flowers and the peas. Yeah. And then you can plant fall peas as well, like more like uh, towards the beginning of September when the days are getting shorter and the nights are getting a little bit cooler. Try another uh, round of peas and you probably have time before frost before they go. Excellent. Yeah. If you want to get in touch with us and have any questions or comments about the show, you can email us at culinarykitchengarden at gmail.com. So today we're recording the show at the Sackville Community Garden in Sackville, New Brunswick. And part of the community garden is a food forest and it's behind us uh, right now. And it's quite impressive. It's pretty large. It's been here for a while. How long has it been here for? It was planted about 15 years ago. So starting from just lawn uh, and the like site was prepared. Uh, and everything was planted and now they're in pretty substantial uh, state of growth. It's amazing. Yeah, so if you could see where we are, if you're watching this on video, but if you're listening on the radio, you know, there's a 30 foot tall uh, tree there. What is that? A That's a butternut tree. Okay, so what sort of things are in the food forest? Yeah, so the biggest trees in there are butternut trees. So those are a type also called white walnut. Uh, and they're a type of, of walnut tree that's native to this area, but not super common. So it's pretty cool. There's two big ones and then a smaller one in there. And then as well, there's a lot of sort of shrubby, uh, shrubby sized food bushes. So those include, uh, there's a lot of service berries, there's choke cherries, there's a uh, wild cherry, another type pin cherry, and then there's a lot of elderberries. So those have really like naturalized all over the area and just sort of grow throughout that whole that whole space. So what's the concept behind just briefly? What's the concept behind a food forest? Maybe yeah. we'll do a full show on food forests later in the year. For sure. So food forests are a permaculture concept. And the idea is that it has different layers of growth. So from canopies down to ground covers and it mimics a bunch of the different uh, properties of a natural forest. And so that makes it easier 
to care for and less maintenance. And it's mostly based on using perennial shrubs, trees, and plants. So there is some stuff in there that you can harvest this weekend, right? Yeah, definitely. Spring is a great time to harvest uh, small greens, green shoots that are coming up uh, and green leaves. So we're gonna harvest some sochan or cut leaf rebecchia, and then we're gonna have a look at the fiddleheads that are coming up as well. Cool, so those are things that we can harvest from the forest floor at this time of year. And we have a little micro forest here, which is a food for us, but you can go out into the greater woods and find some of these things and yeah. put them on your plate. I saw a broken down willow tree over by the train tracks and I'm gonna take some cuttings and I'm gonna to try to reestablish some willow trees over here in the community garden. I'm gonna go look at the Sochan and the fiddleheads and do some harvesting. So today we're harvesting wild fiddleheads. So these are a type of fern that are native to this area, to the Canadian Maritimes, Northern Maine and Quebec. And they grow along riverbanks and in shady parts of the woods. So they're easy to find in the springtime when they're just unfurling. They're beautiful little delicious vegetables, but they have to be cooked. That's important. So you have to take them and blanch them uh, in order to enjoy their flavor. So. These are fiddlehead ferns, also known as ostrich ferns. When they're mature, you'll notice that they have great big long fronds and they look like ostrich feathers. So that's an easy way to remember. And I find the best way to identify them is the fact that they grow out of a clump like this. And that clump has a bunch of like black material around it. So you can see right now it's growing up in a wood chip path, um, but it's growing out of like a hard black a uh, lump that has material from previous years. So that's different than other ferns that may just grow individually out of the soil. These ones are, are always clump based. They're a native fern to northeastern North America and they grow a lot in the shade and along riverbanks in wet areas. So they're pretty easy to find. And once you know where there's a fiddlehead clump, you can return there year after year after year to harvest them. So you can see the ferns are unfurling at all different rates. Some of them are still tightly closed and then these ones are coming up. So this is too late to harvest, but these ones have a lot of nice little tight, tight curls on them. So you wanna clip this off right at the bottom and you can use, use your clippers. And then it's gonna be covered in this papery material. So you're gonna wash that off as you go. Sometimes people will put them in a net and dunk a whole bunch of them in the river at once. You don't want to over harvest fiddleheads. They're a wild plant and you want to make sure that there's enough growing in the, in the environment. Um, so they say to take two to three from each clump, but never more than that. So I'm going to take two from this and they're nice little curled up, beautiful. You can see how much moisture and, and succulents is in there. You can listen to the Culinary Garden Show on CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax. And you can listen to it on CHMA 106.9 in Sackville, New Brunswick. We're also on YouTube, and this is a video podcast on YouTube, and it's also a podcast on the Apple Store. So today I'm harvesting uh, a wild plant growing on the floor of the food forest at the Sackville Community Garden. So it's called Sochan or Cutleaf Rebecchia. So this is a plant that is not native to this area. It was planted in this food forest uh, probably about 15 years ago as part of a wildflower seed mix. And it grows commonly in the Midwestern United States and around the Great Lakes area, as far as I know. It's a type of Rebecca, so a type of Black-Eyed Susan. And it's a pretty aggressive spreader along the ground which is okay in an area like this. It creates a really nice ground cover. Uh, and then it sends up tall spears, which has uh, yellow flowers on the top later in the summer. But in the spring, it's quite delicious. So it has a really mild taste. It has these succulent stems that are almost like celery that are kind of fibrous. Um, and it tastes uh, a little bit like a carrot parsley family. So I've read about people using it as a crudité, so having a plate of raw vegetables with a little bit of this on it. Uh, you can also use it to cook it. It has a really nice uh, mild flavor. I find often spring greens can be either very bitter or very spicy. So when you find one that's uh, sweet and mild, it's a real, a real treat. So to cut it, I'm just gonna go along the ground with a pair of scissors or a pair of loppers, and I'm just gonna cut off the whole plant 
Um, so you can see here I've got a couple of different stems. This is a perfect time to do it because the stems are still nice and soft and supple so I can just chop these up and blanch them and they're not uh, hard or fibrous like they will be once the flower buds start to form. So once they've started to form then it's probably too late to harvest the plant but the spring is the perfect time for spring greens and stems because they're so soft. Uh, so what we're going to do is blanch these and then chop them up and then form them into little green cakes that we're going to mix with just a little bit of flour and egg and some spices just to hold them together and then fry those and they're super delicious. So I'm going to plant some willow trees here or try to anyway. These are the ends of a willow tree that was um, kind of destroyed by the railway company. <laughs> uh, while they were doing some maintenance work. So we just took the ends off of some broken trees. They still have some life in them. Uh, they have the green of the cambrium, so we know that they're not totally dead. This one has leaves on it as well as cake ends. It's pretty early in the spring. And all I've done is I've snipped them and then I've made little points on the end. I'm gonna pull off the bottom couple inches of branches and then I'm gonna just stick them in the dirt here. It's very wet and soft here, so these will just go right in. And we've already planted some the other day and we're just going to continue to plant on because this was a construction site and we want to reintroduce willows into this area. Willows have a high probability of rooting because they have a hormone in the bark that makes them uh, root really easily. They're so good at rooting that you can actually take a little chunk of willow and you can put it in a vessel with or a vase with other plants that you want to form roots, like say an avocado pit or uh, maybe like a sprig of rosemary or something like that. And the, the hormone in the willow will actually um, accelerate the growth of roots on other plants. It's so strong. So these willows are going in and hopefully some of them will take and next spring we'll have willows. The other thing that's really cool about willows is once they take, you can also weave them together into a living fence. Maybe we'll be able to pull that off next year. Just have to try to avoid rocks. And I'm putting these pretty close together because probably a few of them won't survive. So, and I'm just pushing them down about six to eight inches into the ground. And I'll put them two rows deep. And hopefully we'll have willows. I'm going to dig up a tansy. So I guess it's time to talk about our weed of the week. We're over here on the edge of the allotment section of the community garden and it's mostly dirt but if we look down where the grass is meeting the new area we can see some weeds and these weeds are pretty hard to deal with and the whole reason that we put all this dirt down in this area is to get rid of an infestation of this. So what is the weed of the week and what are we going to do about it? So tansy is the weed of the week. So tansy is a native plant that grows uh, all over eastern North America. It is quite beautiful, uh, has a nice like fern-like foliage, and will get to be probably like five feet high, even higher in some cases. Um, some people actually grow different types of it in their garden. I think it's been hybridized as a garden plant. And in that case, it would be sort of like more like a three to four foot perennial. It has quite a beautiful yellow flower. I know it because it looks like a daisy that's had its petals cut off. Exactly. So it just looks like the center of the daisy. Yeah, and it's got like sort of a collection of little, uh, little tiny uh, yellow flowers. And actually, I said it was a native plant to this area, but I believe it's actually common all over the world because in England, I've heard it spoken of as something that people use. So it's actually a medicinal plant. If you eat a bit of the leaf, it's not poisonous, but it's like super bitter, like not delicious at all. But people use it as a medicine. Uh, I'm not sure exactly for what, but if you're into that, you can look that up and find out. Um, but and one interesting use is that people take it and dry it and use it to repel moths. So you can like fill like, let's say a mesh bag with it and throw it in your closet with your wool blankets in the winter. Oh, like mothballs. Exactly. It's like a natural mothball. Cool. So all right. that's a use for tansy, but it grows all over the place here. And if we don't deal with it when it's small, it's going to get really big and hard to control. And that's the thing about perennial weeds is they're going to start coming up right now and they're going to grow super vigorously as soon as they emerge. So we want to bite the bullet and get them out of here. Okay. Well, have fun digging that up. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Ooh. So I've dug the tansy up 
and hmm, I can smell that like the bitterness that I was talking about. And it's got a very fibrous root system that sort of spreads out a little bit and will grow uh, new tansies off the end of it. So it doesn't go super deep. So usually you can just pull it out, uh, dig around it like you would dig around a perennial when you're uh, dividing perennials in your garden and then just lift it out. And then you wanna just throw this uh, into, I would say not into your compost heap, but throw it somewhere where it's not in your garden and you don't have to worry about it anymore. We recorded all of today's episode of the Culinary Garden Show at the Sackville Community Garden. Um, you're heavily involved with the community garden. Do you just want to explain to us what a community garden is and tell us a little bit about the Sackville Community Garden? So a community garden is generally a place where people get together to garden together. So it's often a series of plots that people will individually uh, use for a year. So you get allocated your plot number and then you uh, will grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, whatever you would like in your plot. Uh, some community gardens also have an approach where they have like a communally uh, gardened area so people get together and they grow food all together and then they share the harvest. Uh, so at the Sackville Community Garden it's been here for 15 years and we have actually a combination of both of those approaches. So we've got plots that people can use individually and then we've also got a new allotment area that we're gonna uh, use communally. So anybody who pitches in can harvest from there. Over the last 15 years, quite a bit of infrastructure has been built up here. So aside from just the plots in the ground, uh, which I guess are nominally like sort of rented or like booked for the year, uh, and you get your own plot to work on yourself, then there's the communal area, which is the allotment garden, which is just coming in this year. There's also a food forest, which is a shared endeavor. Uh, it takes a fair amount of spring work to sort of prune it and keep everything healthy but it mostly just goes on its own you don't have to water it or fertilize it or anything like that it's self-perpetuating we also have a teaching classroom and behind us here is a bread oven so all of these things have built up over time some community gardens are very simple and rudimentary and other ones that have been established for a long time can have lots of infrastructure Definitely. Some community gardens are run by municipalities. Other ones are entirely volunteer driven. Sometimes it's part of a community organization. So it really depends on how many resources they have and how many people they have involved and also the membership of the garden and how how active they are in, in helping out with these projects. So this garden here in Sackville, New Brunswick is volunteer driven and it has how many plots? 20, 28 right now. 28 plots. Um, and we're just starting our year and we're pretty excited about how it's going to develop. Yeah, and I think that the perennial areas, there's also a pollinator garden out front that sort of welcomes people off the road. Those are the parts that I got really excited about when I uh, started volunteering here, just because they are really beautiful, interesting gardens to learn from. And, you know, there's a different collection of plants here than I have at home, so you can uh, figure out what they look like do some weeding. It's really, it's really a fun place to learn. And we have multiple gardens and we don't actually have a plot here. Uh, we just love gardening and we have a lot of time and energy to spend on gardening. And we want to help other people like find the passion of gardening. So we just volunteer here and yeah, we don't actually have a plot. Yeah. And I'd encourage anybody who's in a community where there's a, a garden to just go out and help. You don't have to get heavily involved, even showing up on a day that you see other people there and moving some wheelbarrow loads of mulch or compost is like super helpful. And uh, you never know, there might even be pizza. 